Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. So good to see you. For those of you who are uh, viewing us on the live stream, I'm Pastor Ed Seeley, and uh, it's a delight to be here with you, and I'm pleased to have been asked by Pastor Robin to fill in for him while he's on his trip. And he asked me to deal with the subject of eschatology. I'll explain what that is shortly, but it's important that we, that we begin uh, with an overview of all of what's called historic Christian systematic theology in order to see where eschatology fits. And so, as we begin, let's, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, giver of every good and perfect gift, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for our church, and we thank you for your church universe your global church, and for the great history of learning, of teaching in your scriptures. And as we study this subject before us, we ask that you help us understand and apply it, as you would have us do in the high and holy calling you've given us in Christ. And we pray and study and serve. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Early in the church history, the church looked at scripture and came up with six summarized the whole teaching of God's word. And these themes are called loci, plural locus, and uh, they're also the basic subjects, the six main subjects or themes or doctrines that run throughout all of God's work. And if we learn these, it will help us not only to understand the scripture in a nice overview, but to help us to explain it to others. These six themes begin with theology, which is the doctrine of God, the other meaning God, the Greek word for God, logos, meaning word, study, the study of God. Who is God? Everything starts with God. Essential aspects of God include his triune being, that he is creator, owner, most holy, righteous, and just, such that nothing unholy ever enters his presence. His steadfast love to the core of his being and for his being completely perfect in every way. As the owner, he has the, the, the privilege and the right of deciding what is going to occur in his kingdom and who comes close to him. You are the owner of your home. You get to decide what goes on in your home. I can't come into your home unless I'm invited. And even when I'm invited in, there's a limit as to what I can do. I can only do what pleases you in your home because it's your home. You own it. These are some of the key things we need to help people understand in historic Christian systematic theology. It all begins with God. Many people have a very errant view of God. For example, the emphasis that, that God's all love, he wouldn't hurt a flea. He's not going to send anybody to hell. Well, as the, as the church has historically said, when people disregard God, don't want anything to do with God, God affirms that decision. But what that means is that they go to a place which is set completely separate from him. Because in heaven, and in the new heaven and new earth, which we'll talk about, it's all going to be joy and glory. There will be no corruption, no sin in it. And that is why we need to start 
with who God is and what he's like. Then we study anthropology. Anthropology is the study of humankind. Anthropos is the Greek word for mankind, and it includes males as well as females. God created humans perfect, even to a limited extent in his image. But the first ones disobeyed God in this sin, which has resulted in a cosmic disharmony, so corrupted themselves and their posterity that we cannot come into God's presence and have eternal life without his help. In love, God gave his law to teach his will, his plan of restoration, and to restrain sin, to prevent chaos in the now sinful and evil world. This law is good. But it was disobeyed. So we have an anthropology, a view of humankind that was originally good, but fell and corrupted themselves, ourselves, and were separated from God. Now follow the logic of the system here. God is love, but he's not only holy, he's holy, holy, holy. Because of his love, he wants to have us in his fellowship. So it's only to describe us. How does he make the connection? How does he bring us back together? Here's where we study Christology, the doctrine of Christ. Since God is love, he's unwilling to destroy human beings who bear his very image. But to preserve his holiness, righteousness, and justice, he instituted a plan to have one perfect human being represent all others fulfill all the law, which we could not do, and credit that righteousness to all people who believe in and follow him. To accomplish God's perfect will for human beings, that one righteous human also had to be divine. The only one who could fill, fulfill all of God's law is his only begotten son the Redeemer, Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ. And he did so in his first coming. His first coming to earth in this life, in his suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension. The whole Bible focuses on Jesus Christ from beginning to end. Thus Jesus, and only Jesus, as we read in John 14, 6, made salvation living forever in the presence of God possible. Okay, now how does he do that? Here's where we study soteriology. Soter is the Greek word for save. This is the only one of the six loci of historic Christian systematic theology that has more than one name. It's also called pneumatology, from the Greek word pneuma, which means spirit referring to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the primary agent in soteriology. This doctrine also has a third name. It's called the application of redemption. It's the way in which the Holy Spirit applies Jesus' redemption for our salvation. This explanation of salvation explains how the third person of the triune God Holy Spirit applies the redemption and salvation crisis provided to all individuals who believe in and follow Jesus. It's effective for all, but efficacious for only those who believe in and follow Jesus Christ. This is now we're talking individuals. That's the next step. The next doctrine that we read about in scripture is ecclesiology. This comes from the Greek word ekklesia, which means in this translated church. Prefix ek meaning out of and kaleo, the verb to call. The church is called out, called out of the world 
to be holy to God, but get to serve God in the world. And we do that uh, as God's special people. And this is, we are consistent of people all over the world. We read in scripture from beginning to end how God wants all people to be saved. His special people whom he has called to be holy are from every tribe, nation, tongue, everywhere. God wants everybody in his kingdom, in the, in the church. Truly, the church cannot be accused of racism. It's clear in the scripture that the church stands for reaching all people every color. Now, are there some people who are not fully sanctified, not growing in Christ's likeness? Yes. And so some people have, uh, in the church, have uh, done things, said things, done things that are racist. But the church is not essentially racist at all. And we'll talk about that in ecclesiology. Then we come to eschatology, the subject that we're going to spend the rest of the time on. And I'm going to try to go through these slides as quickly as I can because I want to provide a fair amount of time for discussion. I think this will be generating some uh, desire on uh, all of us to want to talk more. And I want to make sure that, that I have an opportunity to dialogue with you on the things that you are wanting to talk about in this regard. But first, a brief overview of eschatology, then we'll focus on eschatology the rest of our time together. Eschatology comes from the Greek word eschaton. By the way, all this is on the slides, and you will have this. Uh, it's on, on my website already, uh, edwardseely.com. By the way, everything on my website is free. And it's also a safe website. You don't have to worry about getting hacked or anything like that by accessing the website. And the, the Greek word eschaton means last. So this is a study of the last things. When the time is right in God's sight, he will bring the present age to a conclusion and restore his original plan in a new heaven and the new earth. We read in Revelation chapter 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. This word new is a very special word. It's kainos, which is transliterated K-A-I-N-O-S. And, and it means new in the sense of renewed. You renewed your house. It's not brand new. Another word in Greek, the other main word in Greek for new is neos. which is translated N-E-O-S, and it's where we get our word new from, but it means brand new. Brand new. Neos is new in time, or in words. Brand new. Kainos is new in nature or in quality or renewed. Very significant. God loves history, working in and through history. In fact, the religion of the Bible is the only religion of all the religions of the world where God is seen as working through events and people 
in history. And he, he likes continuity as well. That's why the new heaven and the new earth is, new earth is renewed. It's not going to be totally brand new. Peter says that at, at the very end, there will be a destruction of, of all the, the world. What he's referring to there is using a, a apocalyptic terminology, fire being judgment. It's going to be a judgment of the evil and sin in the world. The good part is going to be continuing on, reading. And as you read the rest of that verse, it says, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. When I've taught this scripture, many people over the years have said, please don't tell me there's no sea. There'll be no nice, beautiful bodies of water. No, that's not what John was talking about. That's not what the Holy Spirit did John was writing. The sea, we have to remember, again, is a symbol. This is apocalyptic literature, if you've been learning. The sea was a fearsome matter in the first century when this was written. Many people left to go out and fish and, and do transportation and the sea and they never came back. Very fearful. And what John was saying here, the Holy Spirit through John was saying is, you don't have to worry about that. There's going to be no more death at all. So the eschatology is the study of when the time is right in God's sight, he will bring the present age to a conclusion and restore his original plan in a renewed heaven and renewed earth. And how he has already begun to do so is seen in what the Bible reveals about the last things before the end times, including what occurs when we die and what occurs at the end of history when Christ returns in his second coming. Now, just to uh, quickly go through here, I want to make sure that we have time. Uh, we talked about the doctrine of God, who God is. One thing I'd like to uh, just mention is that there are a lot of symbols uh, that explain God. Uh, or the scriptural teaching as much as possible as a symbol can. Uh, one that I like that a, a great Dutch theologian at the turn of the 19th and 20th century mentioned in, in his great book, Facts and Mysteries of the Christian Faith, Albertus Peter, said the sun is likely one of the best, if not the best, symbols of the triune God to show how it's reasonable that an entity can have three distinct elements and yet comprise one essence. The sun, which we look at every, every day, 24-7, we see the sun or its effects through the moon, and at night, the day is the whole sun. You can't have the fire, the ball of fire, without the light and the heat. You can't have the heat without the ball of fire and the light. So all three are, are constantly there as God is constantly there in his three distinct persons. You can see a little bit here how some uh, have visualized this. You'll see this um, on, the, uh, on the full PowerPoint if you access that off of my website. Pastor Robin plans to give you a handout of this whole uh, presentation next week. And uh, you'll have that. The nice thing about going on the website is that you can access the related links. I hyperlink a lot of things, and so it's uh, there. Um, we're uh, going to have to move ahead to to eschatology, because there are some important things here that we need to look at in order to uh, reflect on this subject and get the essence of it. Future eschatology, 
the the doctor of eschatology has different distinctions. It deals with what is called a normated eschatology, eschatology that has already begun, and the cosmic warfare that we're in, or spiritual warfare, as it's often called, and also future eschatology, what happens at the end, what occurs or takes place at the end of my life, and what occurs, secondly, at the end of history. The, We have seen in this quick overview of the six loci of historic Christian systematic theology, how these all fit together in a very logical progression. But two theologians, Dutch theologian Anthony Hukema and a German theologian, Jürgen Moltmann, have observed that eschatology is at the core of Christian theology and the plan of God's redemption and renewal of his creation. Hookham of quotes Moltmann is saying, from first to last, and not merely in the epilogue, Christianity is eschatology, is hope, forward-looking and forward-moving, and therefore also revolutionizing and transforming the present. Yes, eschatological is not one element of Christianity, but it is the medium of the Christian faith as such, the key in which everything is, sent, is set. Hence, eschatology cannot really be only a part of Christian doctrine. Rather, the eschatological outlook is characteristic of all Christian proclamation and of every Christian existence and of the whole church. This, uh, this is... This is seen clearly right from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Genesis 1.1 1, 1 to Genesis 3.14 shows what life was like, or the first two chapters especially, show what life was like when God created in all of its perfection. Then in chapter 3, we see the problem, the huge anthropological problem of the devil. And in, the, and in the beginning of its cosmic effects. But beginning right away with Genesis 3.15, where God makes the promise that theologians call the proto-evangelical, or the first statement of the gospel, where he promises that, that he is going to send a savior that will crush the head of the serpent, albeit suffering himself process, but for our redemption. From Genesis 3.15 all the way to the end of Revelation, we have eschatology. It's how God is unfolding his plan for redemption and the great hope this provides and that only Christ provides. The, the doctrine of our eschatology, where, where we deal with our own individual eschatology, what occurs when we die? What takes place? And in that process, we see that, that we have the assurance that our transportation to heaven going to be immediate. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, we read the <laughs> Apostle Paul giving us a great statement where he says, we are confident, we're of good courage that 
to be, and are well pleased, to be away from the body and at home, to be at home with the Lord. These, these verbs are really very, very important. And, and as comforting as that text is in the English, we learn even much more with the Greek. The first two words, Roman, uh, the, the first verb, uh, is in the indicative present active, which means that this is a continuing, ongoing assertion that we are of good courage. We are confident, the word means, so that we can look forward to the end of this phase of our lives without fear. And it's an indicative tense. It means it's ongoing. This isn't some testimony that we made 30 years ago. And now we're a little bit unsure or maybe have doubts about. But this is a, a constant assurance. And we are well pleased, the, the next verb says, Yudokuma, which means that we are constantly favoring and we would prefer to be away from the body, ekdomesan, away from the body, and to be at home with the Lord, endomesai. What's significant about these two verbs? They are infinitives in the aorist active tense. Aorist is a past tense. This is a powerful Greek way of communicating the instantaneous nature of this. When we are away from the body, or excuse me, away from home, out of the body, and to be at home with the Lord, the verbs, the tenses of, um, uh, of the verbs, the move, the tenses of the verbs indicate us instantaneous. There's going to be no long time travel, no side tracks, such as purgatory, can be found in, in this text. And it's immediate. As soon as we close our eyes in death, we are at home with the Lord immediately. It's a, we're using the errors, the past tense, indicating that it's over and done with immediately. You're at home immediately. It's in the past tense already. Very exciting. And the, uh, the, the other scriptures are, are so comforting also. Uh, I wanted to say one, one, a couple more things here uh, before we uh, have some time for discussion. Uh, the, the, as far as the individual, as we as individuals are concerned, we have this great text, uh, My Precious Wife Carol, and I enjoy memorizing scripture, and this was so comforting to us, especially uh, as it became closer to the end of this life for her. Uh, we, uh, we remember and memorize so, uh, this great, wonderful text in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Cor 4, 16 18, where Paul explains all of this about Christ. And, and then he says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, think about that, our light and momentary troubles. And he talks in chapter 11 about all of the extraordinary suffering that he is going through. And in related and yet he can call these light and momentary. And the same with us. I've observed as a, an ordained pastor uh, for well over half a century and have done much counseling with people. And I've experienced problems myself. Uh, we tend to get tunnel vision and focus it where we focus so much on the problem that we lose sight of broad perspective. And Paul is saying, keep the broad perspective. Look at this as being the reality that these are light 
and momentary troubles. And he says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen? Oh, what is unseen? Is eternal. What great joy we have in Christ. Now, just one last comment before we talk. Let me make sure we've got it. What about the, the, the end of history, the corporate phase of eschatology? Well, we read that, and I'm giving you just a brief summary here, and more of it's on the slides. You'll have all this detail uh, right from the website, also uh, from the handout, uh, the printout that Pastor Rob is going to give you next week. The, es the, the corporate dimension of eschatology, the end times, the end of history, Jesus is going to be coming back again in the second coming. And it's going to be glorious. And he's going to meet his. His people in the air is going to be bringing the, the people who have already gone before us with him. And then we are going to, to go out to meet uh, any, any of us here yet. Uh, I don't expect to be in that group. I expect to be coming with him. But, uh, but should he come, he could come any moment. And we have to be aware of that. That's the spiritual teaching that we're, we're to be watchful. But those of us here on earth who are still here will go to meet him uh, in the air and bring him back. Now there are there are different eschatologies that have added a whole lot of information on this and they are errant description. I've also talked, I've also, uh, I have a paper on that on my website and also the uh, PowerPoint presentation, the, the bigger one that this is just a part of, explains how that how that is. What is called the rapture is misunderstood. And I explain all that in that article. Uh, but the Greek word, the special Greek word that Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians 4, the only place in Scripture where it talks about this, and the only place in Scripture where Paul uses this special word. It was a word that was used when uh, to explain the, the process that people in the community would engage when a visiting dignitary would come to, to visit them in their community. The people would all go out to meet him and escort him back into their city. And this is the word that's used about for or in 1 Thessalonians 4, where some people call it the rapture. The word rapture doesn't occur in scripture. But this is what they're talking about, but they, they have very confused ideas uh, in some of these scenarios. And uh, that's how we look at that in, a, in another time, or you can read it on the website. Then Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats, there will be a final judgment. Those who are, uh, are not wanting anything to do with God and who have disobeyed, who want, to, uh, want nothing to do with them. As you see some of these comments on the Reporter Herald, the, uh, the, the RH line, as it's called, some people come right out and they say, people right here in our community, they say, we don't want anything to do with your God. God's going to affirm that decision, sadly, but they will get their wish. And, uh, and it's going to be a, a very gruesome matter because right now we have the restraint of sin by the Holy Spirit uh, in heaven, or, I mean in, in hell, there will be no restraint of sin. God will not be present. And you can imagine what that's going to be like in rush hour when uh, you've got 
traffic lights and everything like that, but nobody's obeying them at all, and uh, no restraint of sin. For those who, who are the Lord's, for those of us who profess our faith in Christ, God will firm us and invite us into eternal glory with him in the new heaven and the new earth. It's now time where we need to, to uh, give you an opportunity to, re to raise questions. There's so much more to be said. It's on the, the PowerPoint and also on a large PowerPoint to which this one is hyperlinked. Uh, but I, I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to, to reflect a bit on what you'd like to say. In our uh, second Corinthians class yesterday, uh, we're talking, Paul's talking about judgment. And one of the members of the class felt that this was a very negative uh, thing, going to heaven, now becoming judged. And that's really lifting out of context because the judgment is, is not going to be, heaven is not a negative environment. Now, I wonder if you could explain this uh, to the group uh, here today to see how they might get a different perspective on those verses in 2 Corinthians. Okay, I'll, I'll try to repeat the essence of, of uh, the question so that everyone who may not have heard can do it. One about judgment, and um, I, that, that sounds negative, and what, uh, what's this whole process about? Is that essentially it? Um, there is going to be an accountability that is clear in scripture in many places. And I, I, I'd like to cite some of those in, in, in the, the conference. The fact is that God is going to call people to an account for what we have done. And as I mentioned before, for those who want nothing to do with him, uh, he's going to affirm that decision and He's already said in, in his scripture uh, what the results of disobedience will be. For those of us who are in Christ, we will uh, be testifying before him and we, we are uh, going to appear before him to give an account of what, we, what, we, what we've done. But the good news is we read it in scriptures, we read about Jesus Christ and we talk about this in Christology. The good news for us who are in Christ and with Christ is that the judge and our defense attorney are the same person. I don't know if any of you are attorneys. You can't have it any better than that in a court. And Jesus said, I know my people. And so when we appear before he will say, I know this person. She is my, she is my ball into eternal life. That's possible. And that's firm. This accountability that we have is one that helps us through life, this part of life. Here's another reason why Bookman and Bolkman were talking about how eschatology runs through all of life. The logic of it shows that it, it comes at the end, it's the name in the case. But it's so affirming because it keeps us on track, knowing that there's an accountability, and also it's affirming when he says, Well, we can face the servant. Isn't the predicate Jesus? Christ is the predicate in my question. Christ is the predicate for everything that went wrong on earth. And we're called into heaven for glory. We're not called to heaven for punishment. No, right, no, no. Uh, Christ has taken the punishment for us on himself. And remember, the, remember what God said in, through the prophet Jeremiah, in chapter 31, 31 to 34, where he talked about the new covenant. And this newness that we're talking about here, 
uh, kainos is the, is the key at that point. But the new covenant, the new creation, the new heaven and new earth are all kainos. And in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, where God says, I'm going to make a new covenant, it's a kainos covenant. And it means that, and he also says in there, in this new covenant I make, which was uh, uh, the next step in this plan of redemption where he's bringing in Christ uh, to accomplish his redemption, his redemptive plan. He says, and then I will remember their sins this is a very powerful statement in the Hebrew. The Hebrew understanding of memory is that something exists only as long as it's remembered. When it's not remembered, it ceases to exist. Isn't that exciting? God is saying, because of your relationship in Christ, I will remember your sins no more. Any comments or questions in the concepts? Well, we've got some more time. Uh, we can talk more about uh, eschatology. Oh, yes. Hey, it's Pastor Ed, I love in the context of remembering your sin no more, as far as the East is from the West. Yes. I love that. I mean, talk about a science lesson years ago because right. <laughs> east and west never intersect if you go north you get to a point where you can only go south they intersect each other but you go east you're going east forever around the globe good point yeah and i love how god uses that analogy yes indeed thank you any other questions or comments The eschatological dimension of our faith, our Christian faith, is so beautiful. One of the, the scriptures that we were just looking at, so comforting and encouraging. Uh, as, we, as we look at what Christ came to do, he entered into this sinful world, and he showed us what proclaiming the truth in love is like. And the, the whole study of soteriology, the doctrine of our salvation, involves different dimensions, which are explained in the, uh, in the, the PowerPoints. But two key ones, since this is the birth of the Holy Spirit, are regeneration and sanctification. Regeneration is the theological term for being born again. Three again, Genesis. Being born again through the work of the Holy Spirit. And then begins this lifelong process of sanctification, which is not a nice smooth onward and upward. Reflection. That's why uh, in uh, some of these uh, graphics here, you can see the the how God working through Christ changes the hearts and minds of. The the people in this church, and then we begin individually and corporately this sanctification process, which is not a nice, smooth, onward and upward concept. It's jagged. We have our peaks and then the pits. And then we come up again and, and we have a new height, but then we, we fall down. And we rise again, and then there's a period of stagnation where it's just not something really very exciting going on in our lives, and uh, spiritually too sometimes. 
That's why you have a clip when you go off uh, period there. But then we go on, onward and upward. It's not nice and smooth and even, but it is onward and upward. As the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts and minds, as we daily read scripture and pray, and as we, at least weekly, and uh, more when possible, attend worship and engage with the church, because the Holy Spirit is working through all of us, not just us as individuals. You know, the old concept of, uh, uh, started in the 60s, but it's recurring again today. Jesus, yes, church, no. That doesn't work. The maturity, the growth in Christ's likeness, the ability to speak the truth in love comes as we experience the Holy Spirit's work through all of us together. We need one another to reach the heights. God's working through the church in powerful ways that we can't do individually. Uh, how could we do the great mission all over the world if we're only functioning as individuals? The church is powerful. That's why the, that's why the Apostle Paul refers to the church as the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Christ working through us. And that gives us great joy and accomplishment. And of course, that will also be part of the, the accountability and the questions and, uh, at, at the end time, where God is saying, uh, and Christ will say, I know you, you're mine. Welcome, good and faithful servant. Could, could you talk a little more in detail about the nature of our existence after Judgment Day, especially in contrast with before Judgment Day. Okay. What it will be like after Judgment Day. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. that I've got that in the PowerPoint. How are we doing our time here? We're going to have to wrap it up momentarily. But that's a great question. I, I dealt with it, and you'll, you'll see that in there. The, uh, what the question is, uh, what occurs with, our, uh, with us? Uh, we will have a, a new body, but it's going to be a renewed body. We will recognize one another, but the body is going to be of amazing, unknown chemistry and physical, physiological consistency. Uh, we'll recognize one another, kind of, not me, else. we're not going to be unrecognizable to one another, to our loved ones. We will have the same bodies, but there'll be a whole body. It'll be complete. No need for glasses, no need for hearing aids. People who have withered arms will have normal arms. Uh, it will be a body that has substance and continuity. But then it will be one like Jesus' resurrection body, where Jesus showed that he could be touched Help. People could see the, the hand, the marks in his hands and in his side, but yet also the uh, he could walk through doors and doors. So I think uh, I'll be glad to stay and talk with anyone after. Um, also next Sunday is Ask a Pastor again, but that's only the, the two Sundays when that's official is. Uh, or a, a, this kind of official welcome out there. Every Sunday is an Ask a Pastor Sunday. <laughs> Whenever you see me, don't hesitate to, to stop. But let's pray together as we conclude. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the wonderful message that you've given us in and through your, your Son, your only begotten Son, our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through your Word and through your Church. Please help us to continue to understand more and to help others to understand. Speaking in truth and love wherever we are and with all the opportunities you give us. In Jesus' precious, precious, precious name. Amen. Amen.